But you want to go ahead and give us some background about yourself? Um, so, um, graduated from Wilson, um, a native of Florence, and went on to uh, go to college at Morris College in Sumter, South Carolina. Um, I went on to get, uh, you know, picked up by independent team and went and played some, a little bit of semi-pro ball um, or whatnot. Um, I left there and started a bullying prevention company. Uh, wrote a book, um, sold over 15,000 copies of that book and became a household name for bullying prevention uh, around the country. Served on various boards, won various awards, all that good stuff. Um, got involved in politics um, in 2006, actually before I went to college um, with the Young Dems. Um, uh, became national committee man. I was treasurer for, for uh, Young Dems of South Carolina. Uh, I went on to become the uh, treasurer for the Southeast region, which covers eight states um, and the um, U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. Then I went on to become the regional deputy director for the region, um, ran for office in 2016 for city council, lost that race here in Florence. Um, and now I'm up again now uh, running for the state house uh, for District 63 to get rid of um, <laughs> my opponent there and do real work uh, for the citizens of uh, Florence. That's good. Very thorough. <laughs> yeah. I've been doing it a while, so I kind of got it got it in the rhythm, like what people want to hear, what they don't want to hear. So it's kind of. Yeah. 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 I saw that on your website that you had been speaking for the last nine years, I believe. Yes. 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 It's probably 10 wow. years now. Um, I, I have a real fond. Um, uh, relationship to youth and kids because I, I believe that we need to start younger and younger and thinking about the people that are coming behind us. Um, and so I need people like you guys uh, to take the mantle and, uh, you know, talk about what my kids are, are going to endure. Who's going to be the next leader for my children? It'll be you guys. And so I want to start early uh, in showing you guys uh, what it takes to be a real leader, to be genuine and to fight for real humanity. Um, uh, and, and not just be so full of, full of yourself and about so much about party, but what is right. Um, and so if we do that, politics will be much better. Okay. Um, the second question I have here is, uh, what exactly inspired you to run for office? Um, you can talk about the current one or you can talk about any of the offices you've ran for before. Um, it, it, it just, I want to move forward and move people forward. I don't want to get people stuck in, in doing things one way and thinking that we have to do things that we've done for 25 years the same way. Um, I want to be a fresh voice, a fresh uh, leader, fresh ideas. Um, but it's also to, uh, to have a seat at the table for our generation. Um, people that are 50, 60, 70 years, 70 years old, not saying they can't lead, but I don't think they're the right people to lead a bunch of millennials who are 20, 21, 23, 30, we have to get in there and show people that, hey, we got the same ideas, we just do them differently. And so that will let me to run for office. Um, and it just, Republicans just aren't getting the job done here in South Carolina. And we have to change the tide there. So we want to flip the House, hopefully flip the Senate, and do what's right for the, uh, the citizens of South Carolina. I don't know if we can flip this state house, but we might be able to get the big one. The Senate probably will be a little better to flip because we got a long way to go with the House. Even if oh, every oh, candidate, yeah. even if every candidate that's running for the House right now won their seat democratically, we still would be a couple of seats off and, and, and get in the House. Right. Is there not enough candidates out there? Uh, not at this point running, um, because I think it's like um, 74 Republicans to like 45 <laughs> to like 45 Democrats in there, something like that. So, yeah. It's not going to happen. Okay. Um, so we asked this to Mike, but uh, this one's going to be a little bit different because it's 2020, the year of the apocalypse. Uh, what is it like to run for office during a pandemic? Uh, it's bad. It's bad. <laughs> uh, it's just bad. Um, no, no. Uh, it, it's good in, in some sense because now you have to literally um, – you know, talk to people um, in a more intimate way. It's not knocking on the door and trying to get to the next house. You literally are sitting there saying, hey, I got all day today, so let me talk to you. 
uh, people are more willing to, uh, you know, ask you questions, delve into politics. Um, they'll hit you up more on, on social media. It's slowing people's lives down to see what's important. Uh, so that's one thing I like about people being, in a sense, locked down um, because they're actually paying attention to what's going on. Uh, for the candidate, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard um, not being able to knock doors, not being able to go out and meet people, hold events um, and things like that because we usually, as a, as a party, probably would hold a big Democratic stump. That's probably not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, you get all the Democrats in one area, so um, it's, it's kind of hard trying to reach all of those, uh, all those people. So we're definitely spending more money in this campaign time. Um, so I, I just thought about this question now, so this isn't on the prompt. Uh, so there's, a, just thinking off the top of my head, there's probably some voters that have no interactions online or have no interactions, at least with your campaign online. How are you reaching out to those people, if at all? Um, we are doing phone banks. Um, so we're, we're asking volunteers to say, hey, I want to volunteer. They get a group of their friends, maybe five or six friends, and they're getting this link and they're just calling people saying, hey, Isaac Wilson's running. Do you know, his, do you know what his platform is? Here's his platform. Hey, do your research. Uh, he's, a, he's a great guy. Hey, he's running to, uh, to fill that seat. Uh, so phone banking has become our best friend uh, right now. And as we move into September, October, we'll start sending those mailers out. Uh, to everybody in our district, Republicans and Democrats, saying this is who Isaac Wilson is. Um, so that's the only thing we can do at this point. Um, I think by mid-September, end of September, we probably can get out in Canada's here and there, um, knocking on doors, maybe standing back, uh, doing social distancing. Uh, but as right now, we're definitely not reaching uh, the amount of vo voters that we would normally reach at this time. Yeah, I saw last time, I believe Mike got about 33 percent of the vote yeah i think it was like 30 like 30 yeah like 35 36 yeah somewhere up in there um like it, it was pretty of, impressive for a guy that just he just decided to campaign he was working at a coffee shop yeah yeah it, it's definitely impressive that's why we think that we have a great chance so we can turn those voters out and now with uh the ability to uh raise more funds um the ability uh, to put up billboards, the ability to do robocalls, uh, uh, more phone banking, just advertising in a more um, uh, plethora of ways, and having Jamie Harrison running for Senate at the same time. That is incredible. People are going to yeah. come out and do that. So um, we think we can drive about 25 more hundred votes away from our opponent or get more people to come out because consistently in this race, there's 28,000 registered voters in District 63, but only 14,200 people come out, whether that's a midterm year or a general election year, only 14,000 people come out. So, so those 2,000, 3,000 would shift the election in your favor? If, yes. Okay. How do you think the, um, the pandemic is going to affect voter turnout, though? Um. According to what the commander in chief is, is doing, um, it could it could definitely affect if we're allowed to uh, vote by mail and everyone's allowed to do that. I think it could actually work in our favor um, or whatnot, because you're talking about mail in ballots being sent to jails. Um, you're talking about uh, mail in ballots being able to be sent to shelters. Um, you're just talking about a whole slew of people that normally wouldn't go to the polls that will be. Um, we'll be actually voting uh, from home. Uh, so it could help us if we're able to do that part. Now, if we're not able to do mail-in ballot uh, for the election, it might hurt us. Right. It really, really might hurt us because people are not going to go stand on the line um, and the line is wrapped around, uh, wrapped around the, the street corner or you got to go out into the street or something like that because you got to maintain the six feet apart and we just don't have the capacity uh, for that at some of my polling places. Right. So would would you suggest that at least not everybody but some people go vote absentee to make sure the crowds aren't generally as big as they could get on election day yes i would say immediately uh, i think absentee starts at the beginning 
beginning the end of September, early October, go out and vote as early as you can down the third loop at the Florence County Voter Registration Office. Vote as early as you can um, so that we don't have these long lines um, in crowded places um, so that we, people can people that haven't voted, they can get in there and get out. So vote, vote, vote as early as you can. Okay. Hey, um, so now we're going to get into more policy oriented questions. Um, so from this is a quote from Ballotpedia, uh from you, I believe a uh, quality education should be afforded a uh, Quality education should be afforded to all students, no matter the zip code. Let's change that by increasing and properly allocating the funding for education and teacher pay. Would you like to expand upon your hopes for the future of education yeah. and this policy? Um, we, we, our teachers, if you look at the national standards, you look at the Southeast standards, our teachers are way below the line when it comes to being paid. Um, that's why we can't keep certified teachers. We have teachers in our South Carolina schools that are not certified. Um, and that's just a fact. They're just teaching, they're waiting to get their masters or they're waiting to be certified. And although that's fine, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. But when you have a certain uncertified teacher that's teaching a class, um, a resource class um, for, our, um, for our, our students who are not education inclined, that's a problem. Uh, that's where, why we have so many instances of um, teachers probably hitting these kids or don't know how to deal with them or just all of these disciplinary actions from these schools because we don't have certified teachers in there. Um, we're, we're not getting the quality uh, education when it comes to textbooks. Uh, some of our schools have STEM programs and some don't, and they're in the same district. Um, it's just that they're on one side of town. Um, it's just that mo mo most of them are mostly white schools versus a mostly black school. It shouldn't matter the zip code that we're in. If West Florence has laptops and, and iPads, guess what? Wilson should have laptops and iPads. So should uh, South Florence. We have to stop the zip coding of education because it's not fair to our students because they're not playing politics with their education. We are. Um, so um, we need to allocate more money uh, to that um, and teacher pay. Um, and private sector schools, I don't have a problem with them but we can't give all the money to them. The governor took a 40, $45 million. He took 32 to $34 million to give to private institutions. How we talked we about on, that on stream once. <laughs> it doesn't, I don't understand it either. It makes no uh, sense to me. Kirk here works at a place where they configure the computers. Or what, How would you explain that? Um, well, we get them in from HP and then like put cases on them and roll them to the school and everything. So he generally knows the price of how, how much the school gets these for. Right. And on the stream, which I, we didn't upload to YouTube, um, but we calculated in a conservative estimate around 100,000 Chromebooks could be given to children with the 32 million that Governor McMaster gave to private schools yes which only helps a maximum of five thousand people right that 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 it, it is ridiculous um we could have poured that money into um into teachers um we could have poured that money in textbooks uh we could have poured that money uh to building our facilities we know we have the i-95 corridor of shame we could have helped so many schools you have schools that have leaking um, leaking ceilings. You have schools that don't have uh, working heat in their schools. When you talk about schools that are down in Dillon County, we talk about schools that are in Abbeville, like just around the state. Um, and you want to give school money to private schools who are functioning just fine. <laughs> I've never heard of a private school uh, needing the money to fix buildings. Right. Needing money for textbooks. I've never heard that um, or whatnot. So I just don't understand. And then my opponent hasn't spoken up about it. He's fine with it. He's and fine with the, with the governor taking money away from his public schools here in District 63. And the thing is, if you, I mean, if this school's already got, like you said, leaky ceilings and everything else has got mold, this, I mean, renovation needs to, needs to obviously be done. And if you're giving the same school the same amount of money year after year, it's, I mean, they're not going to, they're, they're not going to be able to either do the renovations that they need to do or, 
put money where it needs to be put, like you said. I mean, laptops and iPads. So there have to be um, cuts made somewhere, and it just happens year after year. Yeah. yeah. You've got to think of all the variables that went into it. I was, um, I helped co found a group back in late 2017, I believe, called um, Student Facilities Committee, which only lasted about two and a half years or so. But the, the goal of the group was we realized that all the schools in the district had their problems except for like the five new ones that that were scattered around everywhere and well, originally we went to the three high schools and then the second year we went to all the schools basically and they did fix them they did fix at least some parts of them uh williams probably still gets flooded whenever there's a lot of rain making right. it hard for kids that go to the like 17 mobile units they have back there um to get to their classes that was but, i mean i was there whenever that was happening there would be i mean just water everywhere like even just after a rainstorm like if it rained for a couple hours then you, there were certain places you just couldn't walk yeah. you have neighborhoods um, like that. yeah right so i would think that is a that is a variable in school funding is that Florence not only has the privilege of having at least some wealth, but it also has the privilege of having people that are outraged. A lot of school districts do not have that. Right. Especially yeah. like a lot of the poor ones. Like the outrage mostly behind like whatever we did was coming from the parents of South and West. And or th it was from all three schools, honestly. All three schools were outraged, but it, seeing it it's about if something wants to change in this district wes is going to have to be angry about it because that's yeah. where the more powerful people come from in this town right. you, you can get something changed on south but like north side of town is just that's that's least likely going to happen out uh -huh. of the three yeah we, we 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 have we have some wealthy people uh <laughs> that come from that come from um that come from wilson um, that oh yeah, definitely. From, you know, all these places, but it's like you said. I think when you look at the people that are making the decisions, they're only looking at those two sides of towns, and they're saying, "Hey, that side of town over there is historically black. That side of town over there has a mostly black population." But hey, let's have out the population that looks like me. Um, and it's only so much that a, that um, a representative can do when he doesn't have people that have his back. So when you think about my opponent, guess who was in his back pocket? The big senator from this from this from the city. Uh, and that's Hugh Leatherman. He has Philip Lowe in his back pocket. They all run one side of uh, the whole half of Florence, where you got Terry Alexander, who's on one side of town, and he's lone by himself. Uh with 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 um with Kent Williams, who's out of uh, who's out of Marion County. But yeah. you know, it is it's just it, it, the the sides aren't fair. Yeah, Terry it. Terry's district. I was looking at it. It's a very stretched district. It covers a lot of area. Right. Like it covers like half of South Florence, and then it's just stretched to meet up like most of North Florence. Right. Or most of East Florence. Right. So I think it has Carolina Hospital system over that way, and then it kind of just shifts back to North Florence. I think. It it has I think both Carolinas and McLeod. I want to say. Yeah. Yeah. It's that general area. Mm -hmm. And then the district you're running in, it's, there, there's no way that wasn't gerrymandered. That, that's the definition <laughs> of gerrymandering. It's got like 2,000 feet worth of alligator road on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And when you turn down, if you come on Cashua and you're turning left, well, come on second loop and you turn left by Walgreens uh, to go on Cashua, that whole, and get down to third loop road, that whole section isn't included in my district. So it's like it's, it's carved out. And I got everything around it, and that's carved out to be um, uh, Philip Lowe's district. So it's definitely gerrymandered um, and configured to to win. But we're gonna we're gonna try to defeat that. And yeah, there's there's definitely the voter population there that could shift it. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are more in this area. Um, I don't want to blame it exactly all on student facilities committee, but we did our like maybe tenth of it. Um, but a lot of more people are stressed out about or worried about education now as a subject. You had that um, 
it's not a teacher strike because they canceled school for it. Mm-hmm. Back like May third, two thousand nineteen, I believe all the teachers went up to mm-hmm. the state house. The state house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know if that really accomplished anything. Um, it it it, it really didn't. Um, it got teachers to talking and uh, saying that they have the power. Um, it got legislators to start thinking that teachers are a voting block uh, within the state. Um, and, and some things, some things did come out of it, but the biggest thing that they wanted did not happen. And that was, uh, teacher pay raises. Um, and when the governor last year found, uh, money, they found money in the budget, he still did not pay teachers. Oh, he gave everyone like 50 bucks. (laughs) Wasn't that part of the, um, one of the Philip Lowe Facebook things? It's like, he said like teachers want all the money from a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. He said, why, why, why should teachers get all the money? Uh, because they made people like you and I. They right. taught people like you and I to be able to be where we are. That's why they, de- <laughs> they deserve the money. <laughs> they they were bought by the totem pole. The he other option is getting 50 bucks. That's not that much, honestly. He suggested that they sell chocolate. <laughs> are you serious? That's what yes. we already do. He, he suggested that teachers should, should sell chocolate. Uh, to get pay raises, um, oh I'm gonna God. find that post and I'm gonna post it on my uh, on my page. Um, but yeah, he suggested that about two or three years ago. Isn't that basically a workaround saying of telling teachers to get a second job? Yes. <laughs> wow. Um, Cameron, do you want to go ahead and ask the question that person has in chat? Uh, we have someone in chat ask um, on quote. Earlier, you said you wanted to encourage and show youth what it takes to be a leader. What do you think is a good way to get through those younger generations involved? I think this is about what we're going to ask towards the end, but might as well get it done with. Um, repeat that question again. Earlier you said you wanted to encourage and show youth what it takes to be a good leader. What do you think is a good way to get these younger generations involved? Um, I think the main thing is bringing them to the table. Um, I think you bring those 20 year olds, those 25 year olds, those 30 year olds, you bring them to the table and say, hey, what is it that you want to see done in your city? And you try to make some of that happen. I think they they understand that we can't make everything happen, but you have to give them something because they're a voting block. Um, Give them some some delegation, make some make something where they they feel prideful about. But you have to bring them to the table. I think that's the first and foremost that we must do and not leave them out. Um, uh, and I think that's the that's the main thing I think that young voters uh, want is that they just want to see that at the table um, and not just coming back and talking to those people that's uh, been at the table for 15, 20 years, but bring me to the table and see what's important to me. Um, and I think that will energize our base um, and um, make young people want to get involved. The other thing is we can't talk education if you don't have teachers at the table and you don't have students at the table. So with Molly Spearing being up in Columbia making all the decisions and the governor's making all the decisions and your superintendent's making all the decisions, well, where are the students? Bring them to the table. They understand what their education means. Bring them to the table and let them know, uh, let them tell you what's working and what's not working. And I think that will help. Uh, in the long run, that's being a leader. That's taking the initiative, and that's showing them that they gotta uh, have people um, uh, at the table as well. Yeah, we we have our own ideas about teachers, I guess. Just <laughs> this, I I would say that this podcast, at least the host, I can't speak for you, but we're fairly pro union, which is an extremely controversial topic here in South Carolina. I think our state is the lowest union membership in the country at 2.1%, I wanna say. Yes. I, I personally, I'm, I'm not speaking for you or your campaign, but I do think a teacher's union could at least somewhat do the job. A teacher union could definitely do the job. Um, but again, I leave that to the teachers to decide. Uh, that's not for me to decide. I can't tell teachers, hey, go join a union, and then things don't work out, and now it's me telling them to do that. But I will support teachers in whatever they wanted to do. If they wanted to start a union and be a union, hey, I definitely will, will support them because they're the ones that's on the front lines for more than eight hours a day teaching our children. 
Um, and they are, some people like to call them glorified babysitters, um, but they're not. Uh, they're instilling they get paid the child. They were glorified babysitters. <laughs> um, they are um, instilling most of the values and beliefs that your child uh, is getting by teaching, educating, and correcting your children while they're in school. So they're more than glorified babysitters. You should be thanking them more often as well. Absolutely. De definitely underpaid. <laughs> Especially in South Carolina. Yes. They are below the line, and I, I, I just don't understand why we can't pay them. We have the money. Why can't you pay them? <laughs> don't understand. Yeah. Couldn't tell you. And at least I think it should be on a uh, uh, some year-based things, you know. So your first year teacher, you got a cap salary. Maybe, I don't know, I think they, the base salary is like, around like $32,000 or something like that. Start them off at forty thousand dollars, and every every three or four, maybe five years, you get them another another cap. Well, and I would imagine three, four years, five years, you give them another cap, right? Until they cap all, until they, and then there's a there's a ceiling, there's a there's a cap that you can't go 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 by. Um, that's what most school districts are doing. I would imagine the first pay cap is probably the most important because if a teacher starts working in South Carolina and they're like, "Wow, I'm not getting paid this much," I mean, as much as I thought I was. I can right. go work in, I mean, North Carolina and make more than I am right now. Right. So, I mean, that, I would imagine the first couple of years are probably the most important for teachers to get paid well in Yeah. for their impression. Yeah, definitely. So that's why I think, it, I think you should at least start them off at $40,000. Absolutely. I would agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're ready to move on? I think oh, so. Yeah. Uh, also from Ballotpedia, you stated health care should be a right for everyone in the state of South Carolina. Providing health care guarantees a healthier workplace and economy. We are ensuring that money will go to the right place, allowing citizens to focus on things that matter. Um, would you like to expand on that in a policy or a more policy oriented method? <laughs> expand Medicaid here in South Carolina. That's the punchline. Expand Medicaid. Republicans. House members, Senate, expand Medicaid in South Carolina. Everyone needs it. Um, that's why we have so many deaths in South Carolina, because we didn't have access to Medicaid. Right. Uh, if these people had access to Medicaid, they could pay their medical bills. They could get seen. Um, things could be free for them. We have to start making uh, health care exclusive for everyone and not just people with money. Again, zip code shouldn't determine how we're living our lives in South Carolina. That should just shouldn't be. So that's the punchline is telling our House members to expand Medicaid and telling our governor that it's important. He has a great health care and so should everyone that he represents. Well, I can agree on that. We were when uh, we were interviewing um, Mike Brank, we were talking about that and um, uh, Medicaid and everything and just having health care, having access. Um, it a lot of the time people. I mean, if they don't have money or afraid, if they have something that should be checked out, well, it's not necessarily bad right now. So I probably am not going to get it checked until it I mean, it gets worse. And if that's mm -hmm. in, in a lot of cases, if that's cancer, for let's say, then they don't get it checked out when it's stage one or stage two because, well, it's not fatal yet. I don't need to go to the doctor. It costs too much money for me to go to the doctor. And there ends up being... Um, more of a financial safety net needed the longer that person is forced to wait based on cost too. So when you talk about Medicaid and just having access to being able to get checked out, it doesn't always mean that it's going to get way more expensive because if someone is, has access to go and get that appointment, then they might not have to get, you know, brain, a t brain tumor removed or for instance, it would, it would save a lot of money in the long term because people could go in like Kirk said, for the minor issues, instead of waiting for them to get major. Right. I think, um, because I, I'm a fan of Bernie, I, I'm a, at least a Medicare for All supporter, um, I believe a few economics people calculated that it would save Americans, I want to say at least half a trillion, or yeah, half a trillion dollars in healthcare costs. You could say it was a lot of money. Um, and lives. And and lives. And, and when we talk about access to health care, you have some areas, uh, let's take Bamberg, uh, South Carolina, for instance, who don't even have a hospital. My grandpa's right. from that area. 
<laughs> so if you get injured in Bamberg, South Carolina, you have to take a 20 to 30 minute ride to Orangeburg <laughs> to get seen. There's that's a lot not, of problems in that area. <laughs> that's not fair. Yeah, you don't have clean water. So we're talking about climate change. We're talking about environment. Let's make this thing work for everybody. <laughs> I don't even. Work. I don't think Flint solved yet. I think they're still oh, having yeah. to exist as they can, or as they were back in like 2014, 2015. Yeah, they they're just selling in some cases, and people are getting money and and all that stuff. Some water things have happened there in Flint, but the totality of the issue hasn't been solved. Yeah, and that's the problem. We want to put patches over everything instead of, you know, sol solving the thing in, in a totality sense. Um, any other things in the healthcare um, you want to go over? Um, that that's for me. That that's the main thing <laughs> is getting access to healthcare and expanding Medicaid. Um, uh, we we just need to cover those things and, and make it happen uh, here in South Carolina for our people. Hey, are there any other policies you would like to go over or just anything else in general? Um, we need, um, uh, we, one of my campaign uh, platforms is veterans. I think we've left them out uh, in the cold. Um, I think we've left them behind and they've given us all the rights and freedoms that we have. They fought for this country. Um, and so uh, they should not be homeless. Um, they should not go without food. They should not go without um, having a, uh, like I said, having a place to stay. We should be doing everything we can uh, to help our veterans. Um, there is no way that a veteran uh, should not be receiving some kind of stipend a month um, uh, from the VA hospital. It shouldn't take them months to get an appointment at the VA hospital um, when they have knee injuries that happened uh, 10 years ago um, in, in Iraq um, or whatnot. We have to take care of our veterans because they took care of us. They paid the ultimate price. Uh, and the ultimate sacrifice for us to be able to do what we're, be, we're doing today. And it seems to me that we've left them out to dry. So we have to start thinking about how do we revamp our veteran affairs um, and get help to our veterans. Um, the other thing is uh, we need uh, broadband uh, in our in areas in South Carolina. We need to get people access to internet um, and uh, make it work for everyone, especially in these times when we're talking about students being virtually uh, educated. They need broadband. Um, and uh, so Jamie Harrison is working on that. Um, we're working on that. And we're calling for everyone to to speak up more on that, learn more about that. But uh, some of your people in South Carolina don't have access to that. Right. <laughs> so, um, and schools are doing all they can. I mean, we had whenever we were getting out of school um, in high school, whenever I was graduating, they were they were sending out buses to people because they didn't have access in these poor neighborhoods to to Internet. We were talking about a few weeks ago. I don't know if it was on or off stream um, making like broadband a public utility. Like it, it, sh it, it yeah. should be something that everybody has access to. If it's centrally right. planned, it is also Anyone a lot more least. cost efficient if it's centrally planned. Because right. whenever you scale things up like that, especially if you have like a company that's working with the city or whatever, it's, it's just more efficient in general. People will end up saving money. But I mean, I guess uh, in a lot of states, they aren't willing to put up the startup costs for starting these programs. Actually, I, I really like this. Um, but... So f there's only been a few cities that have done this in America, um, but a lot of cities, I think Kirk mentioned it, have started their own Wi-Fi networks for their city. So they just were like, Spectrum, Comcast, get out. We're doing this on our own. And a lot of the time, they're not only more they they're not only more like cost efficient. They're actually better because a lot of people don't know this, but the internet companies back in the 80s or 90s, or not not the internet companies, the internet wasn't a thing quite yet, but the um, the cable companies back in the 90s, they took a map of the United States and they, they did kind of like their own Berlin conference to the USA um, and made sure that they were never competing with each other. And through uh, mergers and mergers, we've ended up with only two. So there's only Comcast or Spectrum or if you want to, you can get Dish, but that doesn't normally come with the internet. Right. So these companies are not facing any competition at all. They do right. not have to give you a good service. Yeah. They You're are right effective monopolies. You're right about right. that. Right. 
and making a system to where if you don't provide good service, you won't be elected and to you won't be elected for another two to four years. That's going to give someone a lot better reason to give their civilians a good service. Right. Not only that, it gives you service because you live in that town. Right. Yeah, I, t I totally agree. Totally agree. Um, but when the the people uh, that you're representing are not your 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 prime thing, um, you, you get blinded by party, and you get blinded by money, and you get blinded by by the leadership. Um, you start to not take that stuff serious, um, or whatnot. So uh, even when it comes to infrastructure, um, in 2017 we got a D report uh, on infrastructure here in South Carolina, a D. All right. Plus. Not surprising. Um, it costs to drive on our roads, our, our bad roads, it's costing drivers at an average of about $557 per year. And that's what we were, that's another thing we were talking about um, a couple weeks ago is that it's your, if you are going to bring a business in South Carolina, that's your first impression, obviously, is driving on the road into South Carolina and you move, for instance, from like North Carolina to South Carolina, across state borders, and all of a sudden it's ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum the whole way. I mean, and that's your first impression of South Carolina. Um, do I want to build a business here? Is, is, I mean, that's something we don't really think about, but it's, uh, business owner's first impression of the state that they're going to be building one in. Um, so yeah, you're right. It's, it's, it's impeding businesses from coming here because of our roads. Um, and we're not able to, uh, to complete, um, in, in, in a global sense, um, because businesses don't want to come here. Um, I remember a company wanting to come in, um, in here and he said, Hey, I can't bring trucks in here with two lane highways to the interstates. Um, and as you see, we start, started building four lane highways to mm -hmm. the interstates. Um, and so now that's going to start bringing in those big industrial uh, trucks and things uh, to come in here. Now we just have to get the other road fixed um, or whatnot. Um, now we have to finish those four lane yeah, yeah, roads. We have to fix them. Yeah, we have to finish them. Um, even even we have a water crisis here, you know, the drinking water needs here. That's costing us about eight hundred and forty million dollars um, a year. Um, you know, there's about 400, 400 dams uh, that are considered to be high hazard and and and, uh, and and deadly. So it's a lot of work that we have to do, but we're so focused on 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 the political part of it and the gaining of money and special interests and all that stuff. But we're not caring about the people that we say that we're representing. And so that's why I'm running. And that's why um, I think getting in this race was so important at this time. Well, speaking about caring about the people and everything, and you were talking about veterans earlier, um, I think you would agree that it's an overlooked issue that it, there is a whole like cognitive thing that goes on when you transition into the military, and whenever you come out of it, you're not you're not a citizen anymore. You were a citizen when, before you went to the military, and you've been conditioned for however long, for years, to not think as a citizen. So it's a whole, it's like coming out of prison almost back into, okay, I mean, I'm not saying that military is prison, but I'm just saying that as a reference. Right. Um, coming back into the real world and into um, a local world, okay, well, how do I make this transition? And um, I, I want to know what you think about how we should educate people on how difficult it is because I don't think people realize that they're not in that in that person's shoes, how hard it is to come back into the, into the world. Like, uh, okay, well I need to get a house. I need to get a job. Um, do you think we should, I mean, have, um, events with veterans just to talk to people or how do you think we should fix that? Cause I think, I mean, you running a campaign would have an interesting opinion on that. Um, I think we, um, definitely should have monthly town halls with our veterans um, uh, and so they can talk to the public. Open forum, come over, talk to these veterans, uh, and see how uh, their life has changed um, after you know fighting a war, or going and serving, um, serving somewhere. Um, the other thing is um, having doctors there to get them to understand the psyche of where that person may be after you know almost having to shoot a six-year-old uh, child uh, who is holding an AK-47 at him or having to blow the brains out of a 10 year old for shooting AK-47, that stuff changes you. And so for us as South Carolinians, as a government to leave them out to dry 
I, I can't fathom that. Um, and so that's a big problem that we have. Um, and you still have people, like I said, that have uh, gone five, six years, haven't, haven't gotten 100% disability because you're making them go through all of this stuff. We don't need all that red tape. <laughs> right. Just, just give them. I know everybody can't get 100% disability. But this guy that has a, no legs, he shouldn't have to go through red tape. He has no legs. Right. What red tape is he going through? Just give him the 100%. Start paying him immediately. Um, so there's things like that that make me mad. But we can get involved by having those town halls and making them um, uh, monthly uh, in every county in our city, in our cities, um, uh, in our state, rather and uh, having uh, the public come out and hear those stories. There is that basic promise of the military and it, the, the reason that you would join the military up until maybe the 70s, 80s was that you, you would receive the, or do you give your life to your country? Your country will give something back to you. Yeah. If, if you make it home, that is at least, um, yeah. or to your family if you don't. But now- Yeah, they, 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 they held up to that promise because they said they would give you something and they gave them a medal and sent them home. Um, that's what they did. They gave them a medal to send them home and they gave them a, a big parade and that was it. Um, so they gave them something. It just wasn't up to the promise that we held it to be. Yeah, and the wars, at least from an individual standpoint, have become harder, or at least talking about mental illness, because I think it was, I don't know the exact statistics, but the amount of soldiers who actually shot their guns in World War II, I believe is about 40, 50%, I wanna say off the top of my head. And by the time we get to Vietnam, it's in the like 70s to 90s. So that, that's a huge gap. And I, I mean, the war is a, war and veterans is a extremely touchy subject, yeah. but War has changed, at least from um, the American standpoint. Um, back in World War II, you knew who the enemy was. They had the red patch on their sh they had the red patch on their arm. Right. And now, like sixty five afterwards, the enemy could literally be anyone, and that's extremely mentally draining for anyone in that situation to right. not know if anyone around you is your enemy and to be put in that constant mindset to where you could constantly be attacked. It's absolutely right. a, a mental, I mean, it, it, it causes mental instability because whenever you, like I was saying, you brought back into the real, like into a local world, you're hardwired to think after all these years, anyone around me could be a threat to me. So, I mean, that's why, I mean, I think we are, soldiers are, um, just representing more of PTSD patients now um, yeah. because of constantly having to be in that position, like you said. It, it's even worse because you, you went over there expecting something. You expected to come house, come back to at least get like a small house, maybe an okay car, um, at least help, guaranteed health care, and none of that's there anymore. The, the house is gone because they're not just going to give you a house. Like they did, I believe the GI Bill gave houses. Or they gave at least enough money to get a house. Um, and the healthcare in the VA isn't efficient enough to basically be quote unquote guaranteed because you got like a wait a year to get a surgery you need tomorrow. Right. And that shouldn't be. Um, I think, you know, when you come back, we shouldn't be talking about no paperwork. We shouldn't be talking about anything. We should only verify. That you've been in that you've been in military service and that you just came back from a war. That's the only thing we need to verify. Now go to the operating room. Your costs have been paid by the state of South Carolina or by whatever state you've been or federal government or whatever. It's just so much red tape. Um, and I do agree agree that that should be a. Um, and th and this is the thing that baffles me. Um, if I go to the army today, get out of basic training, I get stationed at Fort Bliss in Texas. If the barracks are full, they're going to pay me money to go get an apartment. It's called a housing allowance. So they're going to give me uh, upwards of maybe $2,000, maybe $1,500 to go and pay for an apartment. They're going to take it out of my check. So if you can do that just on a dime like that, 
why can't you do that for our veterans that are coming home from war? That they have the military budget for it. It's just they spend it on like <laughs> drones that can do like that can like three sixty hit like anything in the state of Syria. <laughs> yeah, right. But help our people, man. Help your people first. Um, yeah. yeah, a good person to have, for you guys to have on, and I'll see when she can get on. Is is, uh, is Tulsi Gabbard? Um, oh, that would, would be great. I would, I would, uh, I would love I to have her on. I to her yesterday. Um, she endorsed me for the House seat for District 63. Um, She's very controversial, at least on the Democratic Party side, national side. Uh, that's mainly because of uh, the K-Hive, which <laughs> I'm not a fan of. I don't uh, absolutely hate Kamala Harris. Um, she, she's, not, she's a good speaker. I'll give her yeah. that. Yeah, she's not a Russian spy. She just tells it like it is, and like I said, she's she doesn't care about party politics. She's about what's right and what can unify this country yeah. instead of what can divide what can divide us. Yeah, um, we're ex- we're an extremely small podcast. Uh, yeah. I probably should have opened with that when I contacted you last week. Yeah. But um, <laughs> it would be great to have Tulsi Gabbard on. Yeah. Um, not my not the end goal, I guess. Um, <laughs> my personal end goal is a uh, killer Mike from Run the Jewels. Because he's a, a political figure. Um, uh, he's a Bernie supporter. Not just that. His <laughs> his Netflix TV show was really good. Um, well, I can see what I can do on the Killer Mike side. I do know some people that are uh, there with him. I've um, I got some friends, some celebrity friends, some uh, TV. I'm not gonna ask you that. I'm not gonna ask yeah. that of you. Yeah, I, 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 I want to work I, for that. See, but this is the thing, though. This is the thing. That's what being a leader is about. It's about reaching back and helping people that are doing the work. And you guys are doing the work by getting these issues out here. Uh, starting this podcast, regardless of whether how many members are on, you're educating people. Because we sat here and talked about many policies. We sat here and talked about what was important. And you guys just educated some people. Mm-hmm. So I'm saying thank you to you guys. Because 20-year-olds and 21-year-olds are not doing this. <laughs> so I'm thanking you guys and so that's one way to say keep doing what you're doing if I can make a send a text to Tosi Gabbard and say hey I got these guys that have a podcast hey can you get on there and talk about veteran affairs that didn't cost me anything and it didn't do anything and it doesn't cost her anything she's just going to dial into a number and be on her couch probably talking to you guys so nothing like that is uh, too big to ask so we'll definitely make that happen that, that would be absolutely amazing um <laughs> I didn't learn too much about her on the campaign. Yeah. Uh, but all I remember is that um, back in June of 2019, right as everything was getting started, um, me and my friends took a couple beach trips uh, and we went through Aner. And just that was one of the first presidential uh, billboards I ever saw was her. But she also stuck around the like entire time. Yeah. Yeah. She's dope, man. She, she is. She's dope. When you talk to her, man. She is just, it's like you're talking to a friend <laughs> uh, and she just happens to be a congresswoman. Uh, we talk all the time about different things. We'll text here or there. And I'm thinking, okay, um, are you gonna go now? And she'll be like, what are you doing? What, what, what's going on this weekend? So she's, she's definitely a, a breath of fresh air. Uh, and have you ever seen a presidential candidate get in a car and drive their husband on a snowboard or seeing a presidential candidate on uh on a surfboard every chance she gets she surfs and they're trying to they're inviting me to hawaii to surf so to know her beyond politics you can understand her politics so um we're going to get her on for you guys oh thank thank you we're going to get her on um are there any other subjects that you would like to go over um no um just telling the voters out there in 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 south carolina's district 63 uh to Uh, vote for to vote for a candidate uh, that truly believes in true humanity and decency. Vote for a candidate that believes in true leadership and values uh, and beliefs that we all can be great here in South Carolina, but we all need to start at the same uh, starting line. Um, and if we're not at the same starting line, we can all finish together if we're looking back to help each other. So um, vote Isaac Wilson. That's all I can say. <laughs> um, my suggestion to the very few people, um, hopefully more in the future, uh, that are watching this, uh, go ahead and get your absentee ballot. We don't know when you're going to need to sit them in. Go ahead, fill it out as right as you get it, and send it right back. 
Yes, go ahead and request your absentee ballots right now. Um, and uh, when that that day opens up that you can send them back, go ahead and send them back. Better yet, go down there and drop them off yourself. Um, if we can do anything for you as a campaign, um, you can find us at uh, www.wilsonforflorence.com. Uh, and our email is wilsonforflorence at gmail.com. And I can be found on all Twitter, um, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, I will link anything that you want me to in the YouTube description below. Okay. Um, just send those over to me um, on Facebook Messenger, and I'll get those down there. Um, for the people watching this on YouTube, um, just check out the description below. It's, it's down there. <laughs> um, uh, we got someone in the comments. Uh, they said, this isn't a question, more of a statement. Before today, I hadn't heard of you, but we'll definitely be looking into you more. Loved all of your answers. Thank you. Thank you. Whoever that was, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so last question before we go. What would you suggest that people do to participate more in state politics and elections? Volunteer. Um, get on a campaign, find a candidate that you like, and volunteer. Get to know what the political game is about. Get to know what's important to people in your city and just get involved and work. Um, you don't have to give up all your time, but to give up two hours and make calls for somebody, to give up two hours and go canvas, to give up two hours and just uh, have that candidate just just pour into you, do all you can to learn what the political process is about. And I think you'll be better informed and uh, make better decisions on your um, political journey. Let me just add to that. Um, before everything happened in late March, uh, I canvassed for Bernie Sanders for maybe like six or seven times. Um, it was one of the best experiences I ever had. If you're canvassing with other people, um, at least on the Democratic side, there's a lot of crazies on the other side. Um, <laughs> but you are going, you are definitely going to meet some great people. Uh, your speaking skills are going to get better. Yes. You are going to become a lot more personable and a lot better at holding conversations um because it gives you a goal to go for it's you you walk up and knock on the door and within two minutes you know what you're supposed to say right and then you can turn around and do that again and again and again <laughs> same thing with phone banking so it's a great experience um i'll definitely have everything you send me in the comment the description below um, okay anything else you want to talk out about before we go that's it let's just get out the vote okay uh thank you for everyone that tuned in um and thank you especially to isaac wilson for coming thank you um, so much that was great been the leftology podcast um goodbye everybody all right adios